None of us are immune to these divide and conquer conflicts. We've got to get away from this game of who's right, a game of violence and punishment, and into the heart of that place where Indians go, which is of balance and harmony and recognizing complementarity in everything. It just gives you a sense of the beauty of, of life because you've been close to death. Originally working on the documentary, I went to Mexico to interview Four Arrows. Four Arrows, his given name was Donald Trent Jacobs. He's written about 20 books. I took graduate courses from him at Field and Graduate University. He's really my hero. He's created a system, a methodology, a framework that he calls cat Fawn. It stands for Concentration Activated Transformation is cat. Fear, authority, words, and nature is Fawn. It's how you actually change your mindset, how you change your neural pathways, how you change your consciousness, your perception, your perspective. My name is Wahinkpe uh, Topa, as uh, I was given by the Lakota people. Uh, translates to f four arrows. Long story behind that. My Irish name, which I'm equally proud of and had a lot longer, is Donald Trent Jacobs. I was born in St. Louis, Missouri and uh, 1946, June 13th. Um, my dad was an electrician uh, and mom, housewife in those days. Women could be housewives. But it was a pretty hectic thing. Dad uh, did 36 combat missions over uh, Germany. He had a 20% chance of, uh, of not making it back on each one of them. So they uh, came back as young teenagers, you know, 18, 19 years old. and. Uh, Started drinking, you know, the homemade brew. And so he came back uh, from World War II uh, with alcoholism. So he died at age 52 of an overdose. And there was a lot of fighting between mom and dad growing up, right? So that was my St. Louis uh, experience. Then went into the Marine Corps. Uh, uh, wanted to be a flyer like dad was. So I went into the flight program. Got out of my honorable discharge um, and uh, had it with the lies about Vietnam. Sort of the rest is history. I became a firefighter for 15 years in Marin County. And uh, then I uh, wrote a book called Physical Fitness in the Fire Service. Got me into riding. The next one was about the sport called Ride and Tie, which is a 40 mile race with two people on a horse. I was inspired uh, to, you know, to write the book Primal Awareness. The subtitle, I think, is a, a true story of survival, awakening, and transformation with the Raul Murray Shaman of Mexico. Probably the longest subtitle in history. But I had no thoughts about ever writing a, a book, let alone a dissertation about it. I still had a chip on my shoulder from, uh, uh, from the Marine Corps. And the way I uh, kind of handled it was doing adventure sports, uh, rock climbing, uh, horse racing, um, endurance riding, and especially whitewater kayaking. And my good buddy David Carr, a fellow firefighter, we, we were the first to kayak down the Tuolumne River in hard kayaks. I wound it up in a tree because I couldn't turn it after I went through a class four rapids. But um, one day I, I got a book, The Wild Rivers of North America, and they had a, a, a story about someone who had attempted the Rio Urique in central Mexico in Copper Canyon, 8,000 feet down, deeper than the Grand Canyon. And he didn't make it. Um, I mean, he survived, but he, 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 you know, it was just it, it, too many boulders and Niagara Falls. But I told Dave, I said, let's be the first. We put in uh, our Tower Homaro guide, looked at us like we were crazy because the only people that ever would go in that river were shaman initiates and that was long ago. It was beautiful except we had to portage constantly. It was beautiful, easy going when we did the rapids but so many of the places where the rocks were so deep we had to get off, take our backpacks out, carry them down and that was more dangerous than had the water been high, right? So after the third day of lots of portaging on places as tall as this building, I said to David, it's too bad there just isn't a, you know, more water in the river. 
I swear, within five minutes, thunder and lightning came. Rain started pouring down. Within two hours, the water had turned brown. Water was riveting down from these canyon walls, every place you could see. And we were riding, and I said, this is it, baby. But it didn't stop. Way beyond my skill levels. David was handling it. But we had to scout now every rapids. And we took turns, because it was dangerous to climb up on a slippery rock as high as you could to look down to see if Niagara Falls was there. It was my turn to scout. We had just come into a canyon. The walls went sheer up. There was no exit of the water. So you couldn't get out of this, and it, and it kept rising. So I was scared. And uh, it was my turn to climb a boulder. When I looked over to the left, and here was this beautiful flat eddy. And I went, ah, my luck. I can drop into that eddy and look downstream, which we were used to doing on rivers in California. Well, I dropped into it. But instead of it being an eddy, it wasn't an eddy. It was essentially the river waiting its turn to disappear into a hole no bigger than this. I could feel my boat being sucked into it. And I kept paddling and paddling and paddling. And I remember Dave got up on a boulder and I could see his eyes and he looked at mine and we both knew I was toast. And because you could see the debris going boom, boom, you know, really much faster than the boat was because I was paddling upstream. And uh, then my boat hit the hole, and I knew I was, I was gone. But it stopped. The middle of the boat was wider than the ends and got stuck. So I turned around and saw that in this big boulder, about as tall as this house, there was a, a channel that went up that looked like I could squeeze my way up it. I remember clearly that when I stood up, and I couldn't balance, so I was holding on to the rock, that when I first touched that rock, I felt that same, that same peacefulness. But I was busy with my goal to go through the hole. But I remember so distinctly, because I remember writing that down, that I felt that peace. If I could just jump enough to get high enough to grab it and hold it. And, and so I tried that, but as soon as I started to jump, the hydraulics of the water, I went down. At that point, I was intensely concerned and, and frightened. But when I hit the water and went under, I've never been able to describe this. It was the most beautiful, peaceful, tranquil experience. I actually saw what Ray Moody and his dissertation work on near-death experiences, thousands of people have, have said, I saw this incredible white light. I saw people that were enemies shaking hands with me. I saw ancestors that had passed. I heard a kind of a music that was indescribable. And I just, I was just floating free and relaxed and loose and ready to breathe in the water, and boom, I came out the other end. And of course then, all of that left, and I was in a panic again to not go downstream, and, to, and you know, swimming as hard as I could to get to the, to the top of the rock. I tried to talk to Dave about it, and Dave wouldn't hear of it. Dave was so frightened by the experience that he just, I don't remember if he said, I can't talk about it, or he just showed me that, or telepathically, but I realized and respected that. The Tarahumara Indians uh, rescued us after we were managed to survive, and two animals that we came upon that were notable on the way out, one was an onsa, which is a, a cat, a mountain lion. And we were uh, going up every day on another shelf as the river was coming up in a cave, in a canyon where the walls were thousands of feet straight up. There was no way to escape the river except this cave. And the water kept rising. And uh, we didn't know if, when it got to the top, we were obviously going to drown. And then one night, I felt this walking along the side of my sleeping bag on this narrow ledge. And I looked up and smelled a mountain lion. And it walked over me, and then David, who was in a line with me, walked over him. And of course, like a couple of kids, we started, you know, 
can you believe what just happened? You don't, you know. But we saw he didn't go down to the river, obviously, and he disappeared, so he gave us the way out. That was the cat part of a, a mnemonic that I created for primal awareness. Later, uh, we kept getting lost and coming into dead-end barrancas that thousands of feet down. Um, and uh, again, like climbing out of the Grand Canyon. And a Tarahumara young man showed up every day. Where he came from, gosh knows. But um, he would mark a trail for us. And uh, one day he came and he had a fawn over his shoulders because the Tarahumara are great runners and they run barefoot up and down these rocks and they can chase a deer and run the deer until the deer's feet bleed and cannot run. And then they'll go up and say their prayer and the animal will give itself to them. And so those were two remarkable animals on the first four days, first few days of climbing out. And then on that fourth night, I had a, a vision. You know, I wish I could describe it and remember it. Uh, I've tried to a couple of times. The vision was so powerful. All the details surrounding it were gone. It wasn't an ombleche, it wasn't a vision quest. I wasn't intending it. So my thought is it must have been something during sleep. And I saw this vision of the cat, the mountain lion, and the, the baby deer, the fawn. But then all of a sudden, I was like in downtown New York by Mama Leone's. I don't know where I was, a big city, right? That's a, and cat was a neon light, C-A-T, flashing on and off. And fawn was F-A-W-N, off and on. I remember it just mystifying, mystifying me and captivating me. And, but it wasn't until I got back, and it was then when I thought, I'm gonna really, really nail this down and understand it. I had come pretty close with, the, with my life experiences, putting together the things that came back, like the first thing that happened to me, I had adopted a Mustang from the Bureau of Land Management to do the ride and tie sport with. And I was, I had that horse for two months and I couldn't get near him. That's one of the things that caused me to go on the river trip because I thought I could conquer this wild horse and I could not. So I left him running with a long rope and a halter on in my, in a, in, in my, in my corral and back home in, in Novato. Called David up and I said, let's get the hell out of here and do this river. I came back totally with a different, I didn't have a cowboy macho attitude. I didn't have the chip on my shoulder. And I sat up on top of my corral fence and looked at that horse and cried. Why did I do this to you? I put my head down, and the next thing I knew, he was right there. I reached up and petted him, slid my hand down to the rope, jumped down, walked him around. And of course, the rest is history on, on the horse and the horse whispering. So I really thought about the experience. I didn't want to forget that, that amazing feeling. And I remember really clearly writing about this, because this was my dissertation. The vision was my dissertation. One of the first, uh, if, if not the only first indigenous, you know, because visions are a, a source of knowledge for indigenous people, as I say in my book, The Authentic Dissertation. You know, my, my chair wrote on my dissertation, this is either brilliant or bullshit. And that was the beginning of a 15 year exploration to understand my near death experience, the vision, and what the heck that meant. Over the 15 years between the event and when I went back to help the Raro Muri uh, fight the Fantas drug cartel who had invaded them, I really studied this so much. And also I was getting my doctorate in indigenous worldview. I was studying that and also I was teaching at UC Berkeley as a, uh, a, 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 an adjunct professor in the Department of Psychology clinical hypnosis for MFCC licensure, for people had to have 30 hours of hypnosis before they could practice this in marriage, family, child counseling. So I had this hypnosis theme happening. And then the wild horses were happening. And I had an occasion where uh, people were coming to me because I was training wild horses with what I was considering to be hypnosis because of my training at UC Berkeley and what I was doing and my work. And I wrote an article called The Fear Hypothesis. I don't know what journal it was in. 
a lot of rebuttals on it because I'm saying that the foundation of spontaneous hypnosis is fear. That during fear, all creatures become hyper suggestible to the communication of a perceived trusted authority figure. And that put everything into perspective about what's happening in the, in, in, in the world today. How people you know, have early childhood traumas because of what a, a, a trusted teacher says, you're never gonna amount to anything or whatever, right? And it made sense on so many levels. And then my experience with the Tower of Hamara and their ceremonies and all these things. So I went, oh my gosh, CAT is, is a hypnotic part of life that we've lost and that the Abrahamic religion, religions say is of the devil and that we only think happens in, on, on Hollywood movies or in stage shows, right? Uh, it's concentration. It's the kind of transformation, good or bad, that can happen from concentration. Ah, it's concentration activated transformation. And it just hit me. It just hit me. I didn't try to fit concentration activated transformation into the cat. And then I realized, oh my gosh, that's the neon lights, that's the cat. So the fawn then was different. What would be this connection between the fawn and the cat. Well, I started with the two animals and I studied everything that I could about the, the cat and the, and, and the deer, the mountain lion and the, and the deer and, the, and that, that, you know, that, that relationship of the hunter and the, and the prey. And I started to see a complementarity. So I had the goal now of connecting this as an acronym to cat with the relationship between a cat and a fawn in the real world, and as relates to the difference between dominant values and indigenous values. So I went in intellectually as an academic with that preface. And as I went through that, the four things that kept coming up in one form or the other that I could use those words were issues surrounding fear, issues surrounding authority, issues surrounding words, music, communication, vibrational forms of expression, and nature. I could see that that covered all the different words that I had used for those ideas. I went, wow, there it is, it's fun. And the way indigenous people understand those four things, traditional indigenous cultures, how we all have been for 99% of human history, I see it as 180% the opposite of the generalized way culture has seen those things for the last seven, 8,000 years. I really recognized that cat fawn was actually the solution. What I didn't have was the yes, but how. So fawn, fear, authority, words, and nature. So the concentration activated transformation was essentially hypnosis, was essentially self-hypnosis, a willingness, an agreement to process information in a different way. Fear can drive you in one of two directions, according to Four Arrows, which I found to be true. When you face it, you can go on a path of virtue. It can lead to courage. Or you can go in the other direction. You can go towards drama and it can lead towards cowardice. So you can go towards the virtue path, the virtuous circle can take you towards generosity. The vicious circle can take you towards greed. And every moment, any time you sense fear, whatever the fear is, you suddenly have a choice. Well then once you get that choice, what's next? Authority. When I say the word authority in Kafon, the, the Western way is seeing the external authority. And the indigenous way though, is that personal inner reflection on the truthfulness of experience under the umbrella of interconnectedness. That's the authority. Then people realize that that external doesn't fit the honest reflection of the whole thing put together. And then they use cat to, re, to reframe it, to re 
program it if you want to use that kind of a language, right? Are you tapping inward and listening to your inner voice, your inner authority? When you were born, you have 100% authority over this organism, over the boundaries of your humanity. Because of that authority, you again, you can always take that choice, whatever choice it is, to move towards virtue or to move towards into drama. The third is words. So what is going to affect which direction you take? I had it in San Francisco when I was doing clinical hypnosis. A wealthy man from San Francisco, executive secretary, calls my secretary and says, I'd like to make an appointment with Dr. Jacobs for hypnosis. Hi, Mr. So-and-so. So what is it that you want to see? Well, look, I'll be real quick. Whenever I have a meeting I have to go to, I sweat profusely under my arms. I've got three suits sitting right in front of me here on my thing, three sports jackets and suits. I've gone, I've had drugs, I've gone, I've talked to psych, I've done everything. Somebody said I should give you a call. I said, okay, just do one thing for me. Tell me what you say to yourself just before you go into the meeting. I don't know, I look at my watch, I see it's time to go, and I go, I have to go to the meeting. I said, okay. I said, then what I want you to do is just one little small thing. Change the word, I have to go to the meeting, have, to, to want, and, uh, and, and I'll see you next week. Secretary calls in three days, cancels the appointment. He thinks you hypnotized him on the phone because he did not sweat. This is one word. We say, I need to do this, it has meaning. In, in Lakota and in and Dene, they are verb-based languages. You, you hardly say a noun. If you wanted to say what kind of tree is that, you have to know, is the wind blowing? Are there coconuts in it? Is there a nest in it? And, and even then, it's hard to nail that. But with the English language, it's so easy to have an interpretation of a word. They wouldn't let me use the word hypnosis in my Prentice Hall book which is all about emergency hypnosis. I couldn't use the word hypnosis, right? So words are, are, are so hard. Well, the W, the words, is this outside authority essentially hypnotizing me? So he talks about Rush Limbaugh and how Rush Limbaugh uses hypnosis techniques like the double bind. This is often used by therapists, hypnotherapists, to basically freeze the person and make them, you know, make an impossible decision. Rush Limbaugh used it in a particular way to basically hypnotize a large audience. Fox News uses all these techniques all the time. So there are particular words that go in. Well, what are the words that can countermand that? What are the words that can lead you towards virtue, around the virtuous circle instead of around the vicious circle? A lot of those words are prayers. A lot of those words are words of gratitude. A lot of those words are ceremonial words. They're songs. They're words that bring you courage. They're words that bring you into your humanity, that bring you into your creativity, that bring you into your connectedness. They're words that you can have for yourself. They could be words from your childhood or you know mantras that you develop now. So then the fourth part is nature. People are nature, right? Yes, we're nature and culture. And it is the ceremonial leader that is on that liminal threshold between nature and culture that can bring the nature in the person, the thunder people, the wankia that are in our neurons, in that lightning. In our DNA, we have every species and we have all of humanity. The heart that's beating, all of those parts of ourselves that are nature. We can call on our human nature in these ways. So talking to Four Arrows and interviewing him really had the whole thing, you know, the whole thing unfolded and I saw it. Essentially he has a system. What was missing was what I was bringing to it, which was, how to manifest this in a business setting, how to coach an executive, how to coach an employee, how to bring a team together with social justice at the center. If you go in with the idea in a meeting, we're gonna have a meeting to decide about a protest in Washington, D.C. We got a lot of leaders from a lot of organizations here. Before we start, I'd like you all to do sort of a a psychological technique known as the cat-fawn connection. 
what about this protest? What about my involvement in it? What about the things that I'm bringing into it? Is there any automatic unconscious beliefs that I have not investigated? And what about these four elements of fear, authority, words, and nature? Do I bring into it a dominant cultural perspective versus a traditional indigenous perspective? Someone could go in and go, all right, I see. I see where that perspective, if I could bring that idea that I'm going to go in with a non-anthropocentric viewpoint to where my respect for a river or land or trees or animals is at a level of equality with the humans. Wow, I wouldn't have gone in with that had I not done cat fawn. Now I go in with it and I just do the same thing with other fears. I do the same thing with concepts of authority and my belief in who and what is authority and how am I expressing it in my organization? How are we expressing it in the protest group? How is it being expressed in the groups that we are protesting against? I do the same thing with what words are spoken about how, wait a minute, I gotta make sure my words are impeccable as best I can in terms of stating the truth. Even if I mean the truth, they gotta state the truth. If you do this cat fawn, I believe that you would prevent the kinds of tensions and divide and conquer that almost always sabotage a team effort to do something that's great. The oppression of hypnosis has the dominant cultural motivations of power, hierarchy, control, profit, all of these kinds of things as opposed to optimizing human potentiality, which is what Cat Fawn is about.